So the third problem of centralized finance is opacity. So let me talk in some detail about this. So traditional finance is transparent to only certain people, in particular, the regulator. So effectively, what we need to do is to trust that the regulator has got the information that it needs and that the company is actually providing accurate information and that the regulator is very diligent and checking uh, all the time. So decentralized finance, uh, everything is transparent. So uh, the, the smart contract, anybody can look at. So you know exactly what the balances are of all of the, the contracts, the players. This is completely open. Okay, so, so this is a, a much different situation than centralized finance where we can't really uh, see this. So when you've got a, a smart contract and that smart contract might actually hold a balance. So I gave an example of the DFT token and some USDC. Anybody can check the balance. So think of this as you know, in terms of your counterparties, exactly how much they have. Okay, so, so even in centralized finance, the, the bank doesn't really know how much capital uh, their client uh, might have. They can ask, but they're not sure. Within decentralized finance, it, it's immediate. So the collateral, very, very clear. Um, it's also possible to read the contract. It's there. And these contracts are, are usually fairly simple. So you can determine if the terms are agreeable uh, to you. Okay, so, so this, is, um, this is very uh, transparent. So this also kind of eases the threat of kind of legal uh, burdens because it is transparent. It's there, right? There's no fine print. It is an algorithm, and every single line of the algorithm is the same font size. So, um, so I think that this is, is something that uh, in traditional finance, especially the small uh, clients, they get taken advantage of all the time legally by the fine print. And the contract will be very complicated, you know, potentially, you know, many, many pages. And it just seems like too much for a small user to go through and, and essentially figure out all the details of that contract. This new space is much different. However, um, there's one thing to read a 25-page uh, contract and centralized finance, but another to read a couple of pages of solidity code. So that's one of the languages that's used for uh, smart contracts. So the average consumer probably doesn't understand that code. But again, this is one of the beauties of decentralized finance. It's open source. And there is a sense of the wisdom of the crowd that if there is a flaw in that smart contract, if there's a condition that's not very favorable to the users, then it will be forked. So somebody will take it and improve it. Okay, so, uh, so I think that this idea of forking and the transparency uh, reduces uh, the risks uh, of, uh, of, of a complicated uh, set of uh, computer code. There's still risk, but it is uh, mitigated. So another thing is that these contracts are designed in a way to ensure the behavior of the people that are interacting with the contracts behave in an appropriate way. Okay, so uh, it might be that 
uh, somebody has to put a stake up or an escrow. And if there's a problem, then you lose some of your stake. So it's incentive uh, compatible. So this is, is a built-in mechanism to make sure that the contract is basically doing what it promises uh, to do. So staking is a very important thing that we talk about uh, in this course in considerable detail. Uh, it is the easiest way to basically, um, basically punish uh, inappropriate behavior because if you behave inappropriately, the stake is slashed. Okay, so, uh, and this is again, all built in to the actual uh, contract. It also works the other way where there's incentives uh, to do things that are consistent with the, the contract. Okay, so it works actually both ways in terms of um, both incentives uh, and penalties. So token contracts are really important. And again, uh, there are hundreds, if not thousands of tokens that are out there that are linked to the Ethereum uh, blockchain. And the token contract, again, is extremely transparent. So it tells you what the money supply rule is. So when we create a token in, uh, in my course, I created it and the money supply is 1 billion tokens. And that's it. You're done. I can't change it to 2 billion because once it's in the Ethereum blockchain, it's there forever. So think of this, compare that to our centralized um, financial system or our, our central banks. Who knows what they'll do to the money supply? We can't look it up. They have a meeting and decide what to do. And who knows what that would be. So these, these token contracts, really clear what the money supply rule is, how many tokens are in the system right now, what uh, there might be uh, a money supply rule in terms of inflation or deflation, but it's all built into the contract and anybody can see it. So it's a much different money uh, system than we're used to.